Hey everybody, Mr. Bennett, welcome back. We are into part four of our DNA video series and we are looking today at translation. And we are carrying on from the last video, which was transcription. If you remember, we were down here in our nucleus um, and our DNA transcription process happens inside the nucleus because we need to maintain the integrity of the genome so that DNA does not get in and out of the nucleus. And remember, there are pores in the nucleus and those pores are too small to allow the chromosome out, um, but they're just the right size to let the mRNA out out um, of the nucleus. So in the nucleus, there's a few things that are happening. The DNA is unwound by some topoisomerases. Uh, when we're doing transcription, we're only opening up a very small bubble to transcribe that gene from the genetic sequence into messenger RNA. And when that happens, we get what's called pre-messenger RNA or pre-mRNA. There are some, there's some processing that needs to happen before that mRNA is ready to leave the nucleus. One of the things that happens there is called polyadenylation. And polyadenylation is when we have that pre-mRNA uh, piece of genetic information, that gene, and we add a bunch of adenines to the end, and it's, we adenylate it to protect the integrity of the genome. So when it leaves the nucleus, it's out in the cytoplasm of the cell, and there are some enzymes that can act on it, and other things that could destroy that mRNA, and that would produce bad protein. You could get a mutation, you could get a complete de uh, destruction of the mRNA, which means that the, the cell is not processing its genetic code very uh, efficiently to get those proteins built. So we adenylate it, and that helps it with the transport process, it helps maintain the stability of the mRNA, and it helps protect it against destruction or mutation by enzyme action out in the cytoplasm of the cell. So polyadenylation happens before the, the mRNA leaves the nucleus. There's another thing that happens. If you remember back from our storage video, uh, DNA has got these things called introns and exons, and introns are pieces of just non-coding DNA. They're not junk, but they give spaces in between the exons which hold information for that gene. And again, this is another defense mechanism for the cell. If there's a mutation in an intron, it doesn't matter because it's not used in producing the, uh, the, the protein. Uh, and it helps protect against mutations from affecting an exon or a coding portion of that gene. So we need to splice those introns out of our mRNA. It's translated or it's transcribed all the way through, but we don't want to translate it because it doesn't mean anything. You'll get a non-functioning protein. So when the mRNA, that pre-mRNA, leaves the nucleus, we get what's called splicing. And so you can see here we've got two exons that are coded in green and then this red intron that needs to be taken out. And so these special enzymes called spliceosomes, they come in and they form a little loop. And when they bring that loop out, it's almost like cutting a piece out. So if you have a long rope, you form a loop and you get your ends closer and closer together. And then we have some ligases that attach those, uh, uh, those exons together and that loop is removed. So now we have an entire coding region of a gene in the mRNA. So now we have mature mRNA. Those exons have been spliced together. So we've got a diagram over here of what the mature RNA looks like. We have some uh, poly A caps on the ends, and then we have some untranslated regions. And again, all we're thinking about here is maintaining the integrity of the gene. So those untranslated regions are, again, to prevent against the code of the gene being mutated by some factor out inside the cytoplasm. This could even be ultraviolet radiation, UV light, x-rays, things that are just bombarding our bodies all the time that our cells are protecting against to maintain the integrity of the genetic code. So we've got some poly A information, and then we've got some untranslated regions, and then right there in the middle, we've got this code, this gene that's been transcribed into mRNA, and now here's where translation happens. We've got the information, and now we're ready to read it, ready to do something. Ribosomes are the builders of proteins in our cells. Uh, they're, they come in two subunits. We have the small ribosomal subunit, uh, which goes on the bottom side of our DNA and the large ribosomal subunit. And if you get into college genetics, you see that the small unit is called 40S and the large unit is 60S. Uh, it just has, refers to the size of those subunits. The small one has three regions on it. It's got the acceptor region, the peptidal region, and the exit region. Um, and those do three things. The acceptor is what actually reads that codon. And that's where the tRNA brings the anticodon with the amino acid attached to it. So you can see here in the initiation stage of our ribosome action, and also notice before I say that we're reading from five prime to three prime now, we've reversed our directions. So we are reading five to three. 
we have the acceptor site of our small subunit coming up to our start codon, AUG, methionine. It is always your starting amino acid. So when we find that AUG, we say we are initiating. And this is where the large ribosomal subunit actually attaches. So I didn't show that. But that small ribosomal subunit moves along the, the strand on its own. It comes across an AUG, and now we have the large unit coming on, and now we can begin building our protein. So we bring in a tRNA, or a transfer RNA, with the, the methionine anticodon, UAC. As the ribosome moves, that UAUG, that codon, moves through. The peptidal region is where we actually attach the next amino acid. So you can see here, UCA was our next codon, so we have a new transfer RNA bringing in that amino acid, and that's where the peptide bond is formed between those amino acids. Remember, peptide bond is when we have a nitrogen attached um, across um, our amino acid chain. We get that polypeptide, and as we move out into the exit region, the tRNA, now that it's lost its amino acid, it disengages from the large subunit, and we have an open spot for that next RNA subunit, or uh, for that next tRNA unit to move in. So it, it's that constant flow of acceptor, peptidal, where the bond is formed between the amino acids, and then the exit region. And those three processes on the tail, or on the mRNA strand, are called initiation, when we find that start codon. Elongation is anything in the middle where we're adding amino acids to our polypeptide chain. And then termination is when we reach a stop codon. Where there's no amino acid added, the tail is released as it moves through the exit region, and then the ribosomal subunits fall apart. And then our mRNA is actually recycled. It's dismantled, and those bases, those nucleosides, are re so they get a new phosphate tail, and then they're brought back around to be used again as we produce another mRNA strand to produce another protein. So this machinery is happening all the time. So main things for this one, remember we've got some splicing. Those are called spliceosomes. Um, we also added the poly A tail to maintain the integrity of our gene. The ribosomes have two subunits, the small subunit on the bottom and the large subunit on top. Within those subunits, there's the acceptor region, which is reading the, co the codon, the peptidal region, the middle region where the peptide bonds are forming between two amino acids, and then the exit region where we drop off that tRNA. Um, and the three processes along that mRNA strand, we have initiation where we find the start codon, elongation is anything in between where we're adding amino acids to our chain, and termination is when we reach a stop codon and everything falls off that mRNA before it's recycled.